see all of you. It's so great. First of all, I just want to say I had a great time in Louisville a couple of years ago when I came out to speak. Such a nice, beautiful community that you guys have. And it seems like it's stronger than ever with Rabbi Z and so many other great people there leading the way. You guys are very, very fortunate and lucky to have such committed people in your community. When people think of Jewish communities in America, Louisville does not come or doesn't rank high on the list. But you guys got some of the best, so I don't know what kind of strings you guys pulled. But you should definitely count your blessings there. So um, if you guys aren't talking, um, I suggest just putting yourself on mute. We can hear a, a television or something in the background. So just keep you guys on mute there. And I'm just kind of giving you guys a little of the pano here before we get started so you can just see some of the beautiful view. It's been a crazy year for all of us. Absolutely crazy year. But I know, I know there's probably several of you who had plans to be here in Israel this year and just weren't able to do it. So I feel very grateful to be able to bring a little bit of Eretz Israel, the land of Israel, to you. And especially this specific tour, because this is the biblical heartland. This is it right here. You know, this is the backbone of Israel, the land of Israel. This, the, the mountains, you know, a lot, a lot of people refer to uh, this region as the spine of Israel, just like your spine has bumps on it. So you can see all the mountains, the Judean mountains. Those are like the bumps of your spine. You got all the major cities that run north to west, almost, almost in, a, in, a, in an exact line. Not exactly, but almost in an exact line. And we're talking, you know, from the south, Hebron, which isn't far from where we are. And we'll do a tour of there one day. And, uh, and then you have Gush Etzion, where I am. You have Beit Lechem, which is just over there. Just over there. That's Beit Lechem. Hometown of David and Mela, King David. And then just over here, you have Yerushalayim, and you can see they got these great, you know, amazing binoculars over here for people to see. And with these high power binoculars for people who come to visit here, you can actually see the old city walls and Harabite. That's Jerusalem, just over there, just over there. I was there today, actually. Maybe you guys know Rabbi Ken Spiro. He's an author, a Crash Course in Jewish History is his probably most famous book, but he's got, I don't know, maybe even 10 books. World-renowned lecturer. I was actually recording him today, doing a little tour in Yerushalayim. All right, David. Whenever David Sussman, whenever you're ready to go, or it's all you. All right, fantastic. Let's just flip this around. Hey, <laughs> this is great. Okay, first of all, since now we're really officially starting, I just want to give a huge yasha talk. More power to you, to the entire Kite organization, to Rabbi Z, and for everybody that you work with for doing the tremendous work that you do to keep people connected to themselves, their Jewish identity, but also to the land of Israel and for making this tour possible and for um, realizing the importance of connecting to our biblical heartland, to the land of Israel, right? I always tell my kids, you know, kids will be kids, and my kids also, they eat a little something, they put it on the ground, and I say, how can you do this? It's Eretz Kodesh. it's the holy land, this is our land. You got to love it, you got to nurture it, you got to till it, you got to work it, and you got to make it blossom and bloom. And that is what we're going to be doing today, is actually seeing that effort of our forefathers. And we're not even talking about our forefathers from 3,000 years ago, 3,800 years ago who we are going to discuss. And we're actually going to see an ancient mikvah from like 2,000 years ago that I guarantee you, everybody who's with us today, right now on this tour, and all of your friends who couldn't make it for whatever good reason that they had, that their great, great grandparents, everybody great to go 2,000 years ago, there's no doubt in my mind that your great grandparents used that mikvah because the road that we are highlighting, the path of the patriarchs and the matriarchs, our forefathers, they use this path, and I am going to go in depth and allow you guys to hopefully receive this knowledge that will give you the clear understanding that this was the path that they used 3,800 years ago, 3,000 years ago, 2,500 years ago, 2,000 years ago, before the destruction of the Second Temple, and even beyond after that. We're going to see that this road was used 
by the Romans. We're going to see ancient Roman pillars. We're going to talk about some of the communities and the villages. We're going to talk about the story of Hanukkah. So much happened right where I'm standing right now and along this entire ridge line that goes from the south in that direction, right? The city of Hebron, all the way to the north in Jerusalem and even a little bit beyond that. And the communities that lie in the valleys, in the valleys down below um, here in the Judean mountains that played an important role in our history. We're going to talk about biblical agriculture. We're going to see some vineyards. It's going to be absolutely stunning. And I'm glad and happy that you guys are able to join us here today. So let me just tell you a little bit about where I am and why I wanted to begin here. So this is called Mitzkor Ha'ela, the thousand meter overlook. And the reason why is that this peak that I'm in right now, that I'm standing on top of, I'm on like a little bit of a tower on top of the highest peak here in Gush Etzion. This is the highest place that you can come. You can get a 365 degree, 360 degree view from in the east going in that direction. You can actually on a clear day see the Moab Mountains. Maybe we'll talk a little bit about Moab and who they were. But that's Jordan. And literally a 10-hour hike from here, you're at the Dead Sea. I've done it. I've done it. Maybe not from this exact location, but just the next hilltop over. You can hike to the Dead Sea over in that direction. And you got Yerushalayim, as I said, just over there. So from this vantage point, you get to see literally the entire width of Israel. Now, in addition to the great views that you have here, it's also the continental divide. So when it rains here, and this is the rainy season, it's the tail end of the rainy season. We had some rain, thank God, last week, that from here, everything that flows to the west of this mountain will flow towards the Mediterranean Sea. And everything that's going to flow in this direction, flowing east, that's going to flow towards the Dead Sea. So this is the continental divide of the spine, the backbone of the land of Israel, running from the north, the Shomron, all the way through the Judean mountains and Judea, all the way towards uh, Hebron. So Israel, I, you know, uh, David uh, Kaplan, who's with us here today, not related to Howard, but I'm sure that they're brothers from different mothers, that this is a microcosm of the entire land of Israel, that every single hilltop and every single valley is a little bit different than the one that's next to it, just like here in Israel, a small, small country. The, all of Israel, the entire land of Israel is like the size of New Jersey. That's mind boggling to even comprehend because we think it's so big because of its spiritual you know, uh, um, powers over here, but also because it's in the news all the time, but really Israel, I'm sure all of you guys know this already, because you're here and you have a passion for Israel, that it's the size of New Jersey. The size of New Jersey, it's so small and yet so diverse. In the north, you've got the Upper Galilee, uh, the Hula Valley, the beautiful Hula Valley with its uh, with what used to be a natural swamp and now a man-made swamp that attracts birds from three different continents. To the west, you have Europe. To the east, you have Asia. To the south, you have Africa. And all of the migration that takes place here, you literally have 500 million birds that pass through here during the bird migration. Each one, there's two of them. So that's a billion birds or 500 million birds twice that pass through the land of Israel. It's really just amazing. Moving south from the north, right? Upper Galilee, Hula Valley. To the east of that, you have the Golan Heights, which is all volcanic rock and beautiful and amazing vineyards over there as well. That volcanic rock giving a robust flavor to the grapes. We're going to talk a little bit about the wine industry where we see the vineyards of Gush Etzion. But you also, moving south from all that, you have the Jordan Valley and the Jordan River, which flows into the Dead Sea, which is just over there, as I mentioned before. You got the Dead Sea, you got the Arava, you got the Ela, which is really a little piece of the Sinai Desert. You got the coastal plains just behind me over there with the sudden setting sun. You have Tel Aviv, the entire coastal plains, the Shvela, the foothills that lead up to the mountainous area that I'm in right now. I'm just giving you guys a little bit of a taste of the variety that you can get in a place the size of New Jersey. So I wanted to start here so that we get this beautiful, amazing, epic view. And I'm looking at the screen right now, and I can see it's really coming out quite well. I hope you're appreciating everything that you're seeing right here of this beautiful community. What I'm going to do is I'm going to jump into my car because we've got a little bit of a short drive just to get to the path of the patriarch. 
But we're going to go through this community over here, which is called Neve Danielle. And I'll stick the camera outside so that you guys get a little bit of view. Probably be some people exercising, walking around, kids playing in the streets. But this is a nice community here in Gush Etzion. And you can see there's a little bit of construction. They're moving a little bit of earth over here. They're making this big development right here, beautiful apartments that they're building here. If you guys want to get a nice vacation home, investment property, or move here, this is the time to get it on paper. It'll be finished in about two years' time. But from the apartments facing west, again, on a clear day, which is most days, you get a view of the skyline of Tel Aviv. You get a view of the skyline of Tel Aviv. Really impressive, beautiful. I mentioned earlier, I can't see it right now, but I was able to see the shimmering light from the sun on the Mediterranean, on the Mediterranean Sea that is just over there. So I'm literally just walking down a path right now. I'm heading towards my car. And what I want to do though, is we've got this cute little bustan, this, this little uh, agriculture, a few trees are growing here. They look dead obviously because this is the end of winter, but, the, but they're not. We have some fig trees over here. And this one over here, when it's in bloom, would be a nice, beautiful pomegranate tree. But what we have over here is an olive tree. And I like to stop here because the olive tree has a, many deep, beautiful, incredible messages about olive oil and the production of it and you know how the olive relates to the Jews of the world. But what I want to talk about right now is Noah, right? The... Uh, Noah had Tzadik, right? The Noah's Ark and the great flood that took place. When the flood was over, he sent out the dove and the dove came back with an olive branch. Now, the Tanakh was written by who, right? The Bible, the, the five books of Moses, right? Was written by who, right? Most people say it was written by Moses, right? But it really was, it may have been written down by Moses, but it was really handed over by Hashem himself. And Hashem, in his infinite, infinite wisdom, doesn't just pick random plants to mention in random times. In the Bible, everything's got a very deep message. And the olive branch has a very deep message. And what does the olive represent, right? Most people are going to say that the olive represents peace. But the olive branch doesn't represent peace. The fig tree, which we can see over here, it's not bloom, we can see the fig tree over here, right? The fig really in Judaism represents peace, right? In the prophet Amos, it says that during the days of Mashiach or in, in days of tranquility, every man will sit underneath the shade of his fig tree, looking out over his vineyard and tasting some of that delicious wine. So the fig represents the, uh, the, the peace, the olive branch represents, the olive branch represents freedom. And how do we get that? What was the dove really trying to say to Noah? What was he trying to say to Noah? He was saying of all the seven species, right? There's seven major species in Israel that grow really, really well. Olive is one of them. Grapes are one. There's two grains. You have wheat and you have barley. You have figs, grapes, and uh, pomegranates. But this is the only fruit of the five that are fruit trees that you can't just pick an olive. And I don't see any olives here, but you can't just pick an olive off a tree like you can an apple and bite into it. It's bitter. So the dove was really saying, and this all comes from Rashi, a great commentator on, the, on Tanakh, on the Bible. He was really saying is that I would rather eat the bitter fruit of an olive tree then to have these three gracious, beautiful, divine meals, which Noah was feeding the animals every day, three times a day, I would rather have bitter fruit from the hands of God than to rely on man, than to rely on you. And why do I share that? I just feel like during these times of Corona, at least for me, I've had a tremendous opportunity, and I, and I believe I've seized it, and, and I hope I have, to really dig down deep inside myself and be and be become more introspective and to think about what I really need and what I what 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 am I relying too much on and, and am I digging myself a deeper hole and what do I mean by that Rashi says that the dove was saying that I would rather have this bitter fruit and rely on God Hashem than to have your beautiful food but to be trapped in your golden cage right we we all know people can't afford their house payments and the car payments are, you know, they're just getting by. And the next thing you know, they're getting a new car, right? Because they want to have a golden cage. I'd rather be free. I'd rather take the olive. I'd rather 
survive on the on my means and not find myself in debt. Please, God, none of us shall find ourselves in debt. So I'm going to jump into my little forward focus over here. You know, it's amazing. Here, I'm telling you, this is a 2011. I got 103,000 miles on it. And this beautiful little Ford Focus I have right now, this is a middle-class vehicle here in, um, in Israel. You do not find many large cars here. You definitely aren't going to find a lot of BMWs or Mercedes. But even nice cars, you know, maybe the hybrid, the Toyota, you're going to find. But, of course, you do have some of the, of the nicer vehicles, what we would call the nicer vehicles. In, um, in in America here in Israel as well. So here, I just jumped on in. My window. The car looks very clean, David. What's that? The car looks very clean. Oh yeah, sure. <laughs> um, hold on one second here. I got you on my Bluetooth in the car and I don't want that. Looks like we lost him. I'm sure he'll come back soon. Oh, he's back. All right, good going. That was quick. That was quick. Let me know you hear me. Let me give a thumbs up. I, I have thumbs up, but you might have to adjust yeah. your phone no. again. I see it. Okay. There we go. All right. Fantastic. Let me just do a little swipe. You guys doing good? David, you doing good? Masanel, you doing good? You got your kids there. Wonderful, Nishi. It's good to see you. Revitin. Hey, what's up, Wasser kids? You guys doing good? It's good to see you. All right. All right. Let me just swipe back. All right. Pin my video, please, Rabbi. Awesome. Awesome. All right. I got my hand out the window. Hopefully I won't get some frostbite. And we're just cruising. You can see the, these uh, little side roads, even the path of Patriarchs, which is a dirt road. You can see people use it as a shortcut. And there's a small, tiny little community behind me in this road. Maybe 20 families live out there. And uh, I'm assuming that some of these people coming back are those families heading home after a wonderful day, maybe just coming home from school. But now we're in the large community of the Fed, Danielle. And Gush Etzion, I mean, I, I do live here, so I'm, I'm somewhat impartial to it, but Gush Etzion is a, a very well-respected area region here in Israel. It's got a wonderful education system. And you can see, you know, a lot of people, they go to Jerusalem and, and, and yes, in any city, people live in, in more confined areas, more apartments. But you can see there's a lot of beautiful homes here in the Ve Danielle and really all over Gush Etzion. And like I said, every community is a little bit different than, than the one next to it. It attracts a different, you know, breed of people. Um, Neved Danielle has a lot of um, professionals, a lot of lawyers, a lot of doctors who live here, um, some professors, and it also has a very large Anglo community as well. And the Anglo community here in Gush Etzion, you know, holds various types of jobs, but there are a number of people here who have businesses that are operating in America or South Africa, uh, England. And they do commute a little bit back and forth, you know, several times a year, five, six, seven times a year. Some even a little bit more, if you can imagine that. And they make that sacrifice of having to commute and going back and forth and being away from home for a week, 10 days, whatever it might be, uh, in order to ensure that their um, children have that opportunity to live out the dreams of, you know, not even our ancestors, right? Our, our grandparents, our great grandparents, great great grandparents. I mean, how many generations are most are are you guys in America for? It's a question I ask often to my groups: is you know, how many people are in America for one generation? You know, few people. Hand, I'm first generation American. How many people are second generation? How many people are third generation American? 
And it's incredible that I am first generation American. I've been living now in Israel for 20 years. I lived in America for 24 years. So in another, I don't know what that would be, another four years, it'll be hetsy hetsy, half, half, half of my life spent in America, half in Israel. But I'm American because this is that's where I grew up, right? I'm I'm very much American. And people know it when they see me here. They're like, oh yeah, he he made Aliyah. He he became a citizen of Israel from America. Um, but I was only there for one generation. So a lot of the community here in Gushetzion and Nebe Danielle who commute, they said, hey, I want my kids to live out those dreams um, that we all share about one day living here in Israel. And so they make that sacrifice and the kids get to grow up here. And uh, it's incredible. I mean, my son is six years old and we go to places and I, and I obviously I'm, I'm a tour guide. So I like to tell them the story as much as possible. Um, and oftentimes they add in what they're learning in school. Oh, yes, this is where the prophet did that. Or this is where this miracle took place. Or, you know, this was the tribe of, right? I'm sure in Kentucky, you guys have regions and councils, counties. Um, well, here of the regions in Israel are named after the children of Yaakov, Jacob, the 12 tribes of Israel. Jacob was also got a second name later on in his life, and that name was Israel, Israel. And so we're called the 12 tribes of Israel, B'nai Israel, the children of Israel. And those 12 children became the tribes of Israel. And each of them got a section, a territory, a county, if you will, here in the land. And today the regions, the counties here in Israel, are named after those tribes, depending on where the county is located. So this is the tribal territory of Yehuda, of Yehuda. And you go towards the Dead Sea, and you'll enter into the tribe of Benjamin, right? Benjamin, Benjamin. So we are now on the path of the patriarchs, and we are going to cruise down this dirt path for the remaining of the tour and for probably a couple of miles, but I am going to stop here briefly. Bringing this back in the car for a second. I don't even think I'm gonna turn off the car because I want to show you one of the proofs that archeologists use to know that this is the path of the patriarchs, right? Look, how epic is that shot, my friends? How beautiful is that right now? Tell me you don't want that on a magnet, stick it on your fridge so you can see that every day when you open up for your milk to have your coffee in the morning. But the pillar that we're looking at right here, that is a Roman mile marker, okay? Now the Romans did not reinvent the wheel. They took the wheel and they improved upon it. Now, what do I mean by that? This is a fairly wide road. When our forefathers talking about Abraham, right, Isaac, Jacob, when they were walking here, this would be a small path, right? You're gonna take your donkey most likely or your horse through here. But this is very, very wide in order for the Romans to bring their large caravans through and more importantly, to bring their war machines, right? The war machines through here. And this isn't original, but there are places here on the path of the patriarchs that you can still see the original Roman paving stones. And these were all marked and etched. Can't see it on this one here, but they're all marked and etched. Some of them, you can see them really well. And it would tell you 11 miles, 12 miles, 13 miles, 14 miles. And I chose those specific ones because here on the path of the patriarchs, we found 11 through 14, these mile markers. And we're talking about a Roman mile, not an American mile, but these Roman mile, these Roman miles were almost the same as the miles that we have today. And so what does it mean that this is the 11th mile marker? Just like you have mile markers on the roads in America, in Louisville, on the interstate that tell you how many miles along the interstate you are in case you get into an accident. You can report where you are, but today everybody has ways and it's not so, so difficult to find somebody. But this meant that we were 11 miles from Jerusalem. Jerusalem was that way, going from Hebron to the south to Jerusalem. So I'm going to take you down this little path right here. And I am so enjoying this myself right now. 
it's so funny how you can see, you know, the real shot in front of you, but sometimes you just get sucked into the video, even when you're taking it, because it just looks amazing, especially at this time of the day, to be able to look down on the valleys of Judea and the biblical agriculture that we're going to talk about in a little bit. And the sun setting behind that community just over there. And that's the community of Elazar, which we're going to talk about because he was an important character during the story of Hanukkah. But I am going to flip it around so that you can see my pretty face again. And I'll even just go around here. There's a little opening in the fence. I know all the moms out there are freaking out right now as I come towards the edge. But it's worth it because this is just an epic view. The land of Israel. All right, over there where the light is shimmering, you can see a few buildings sloping up right there. Let me just see if, uh, okay, I can't really focus in on that. Let me see if I flip the camera around. If you get a better shot, you get a little bit of a better shot that way. So right over there, you have the largest, you know, settlement. And I hate this word settlement. It's the settlement of Betar. I hate this word settlement because people have such a negative connotation to this idea of a settlement. You know, settlers and oh, what's going on over here? But this is just, you know, how else are you supposed to refer to? You got Arab settlements, you got Jewish settlements. But if you really want to use the word settlement, I tell people to use, instead of settlement, say resettlement. Because those people over there are just resettling. I said that's the city of Betar. They're resettling the ancient city of Betar, which is located just a little bit below it, which are the buildings you can see right there, right? Because they're a little bit closer to us, so you can see them. That's the ancient city of Betar, which is now inhabited by an Arab community, right? The Arabs settled there. So why didn't the Arabs change the name of Betar, right? Well, they did a little bit. It's called Batir, Batir, Betar, Batir, right? They changed it a little bit, but it's basically Betar. Whoever invaded the land of Israel from the Romans to the Arabs to the Crusaders, they basically kept almost always kept the original name of the hilltop, the community in which they conquered, they destroyed, they built up upon, up upon it, up on top of it. And, uh, and so that's what they did over there with Betar. They called it Batir, right? And Betar is important because during the Second Temple period, you had the Romans who came in and destroyed the Second Temple in the year 70 CE, right? We commemorate its destruction on the 9th of Av, Tisha B'Av. Usually falls late July, early August uh, on the Gregorian calendar. And Tisha B'Av commemorates not only the destruction of the second temple, but really the first temple as well as other tragedies in Jewish history. And uh, But in Betar, Betar, there was still a stronghold of Jews who were still resisting. And from not Beethoven, but from this region rose up a mighty Jewish warrior by the name of Shimon Bar Kokhba. And Bar Kokhba rebelled against the Romans a second time, less than 70 years after the destruction of the Second Temple. And he was so successful that he actually was able to throw out all of the Roman legionnaires and all of the Roman you know, ruling class. And there was no Roman influence on us anymore. We had complete autonomy at this period of time. In fact, we printed our own coins again. We made the blueprints and rebuilt the Beit HaMikdash. Jews were coming from around the world, returning to the land of Israel. And the last major battle, the Romans said, we can't have this. And they bring in like half the Roman army. And the last major battle took place there in Betar. And in our scriptures, it says that there was blood that ran from Betar, the city right there, from Betar, all the way to the Mediterranean behind me. We saw the sun setting. I told you that on a clear day, you can see the skyline of Tel Aviv. Now, I don't know if there was blood running that far and that long of a distance, but you can imagine that there must have been a lot of blood that was shed over there. So Betar is a very, very important historical place for the Jewish people. But what I would like to really remember when I come here is that this is... You know, we know that these are the areas because the people who invaded our land and occupied our land and stayed here, they left, you know, the names there. So we have this, this physical proof of our connection to this area. Now, there are a few cities that the Romans 
And later on, the Arabs did change. Now, one of the cities whose name was changed during the Roman period was a city by the name of Shechem. Okay? Now, you know, the, the Romans changed Jerusalem. You know, they called it Ilio Capitolina. A guy by the name of Hadrian was really the one who fought against Bar Kokhba. But they changed the name Shechem. And the main reason why they changed the name Shechem, well, I'm sure you probably guessed it already, Shechem. It was a little bit uh, difficult for them to say that Chet, Shechem, that uh, they changed it to Neopolis. Now, Neopolis is a, I'm going to give you guys this view, don't worry. I've seen enough of my face. Neopolis, I'm going to do it just like this because it is kind of getting a little bit chilly out there. Neopolis was, um, they called it the new city. Neo, new polis, city, Neopolis. Shechem became Neopolis. And when the Arabs came here, there's no P. There's no P in the Arab alphabet. And Neopolis became Neobolis, Neobolis, and Neobolis eventually became Nablus, right? And a lot of people know Nablus because you hear about it on the news a lot, especially during the Second Intifada in the early 2000s, because there was a lot of Arab-Palestinian resistance that was coming out of the city of Nablus. But really, that city is Shechem. And it's the burial place of Yosef, Yosef Atzadik, who was sold into slavery and became the viceroy, second in command of Egypt. That is where he was buried. It's also the first place that Avraham pitched his tent. Right? When Avraham came into the land of Israel and he made a communion, stayed for a little while, not just like one night. The first place was in Shechem. Also, when the Jews returned from Egypt, the first place we went to was Shechem. And there's a very, two famous mountains there, the Mountain of Blessings, our bracha, and also the Mountain of Curses. And a lot of Jewish history, biblical history, took place in Shechem, which the Arabs now call Nablus, Neobolis, which the Romans changed to Neopolis. And why do they call it Neobolis? Just to review a little bit here, is because there's no p sound in Arabic. And so if there's no p sound in Arabic, then where does the name Palestine come from? Right? Where does the name p Palestine come from if there's no p sound in Arabic? Right? And oftentimes people say, well, the name Palestine comes from the Palestinian people. And that's not true. The Palestinian people took the name Palestine or Palestinian because that's what this area was referred to for a really, really long time. So who named it Palestine? So during that great revolt led by Shimon Bar Kokhba, right, here's another view, I'm just turning the camera, you can see I got my hand out of the car, right here you can see a gentleman running, getting some exercise, running down the path of the patriarchs, that in Betar, Shimon Bar Kokhba, so Hadrian, who was, who was the emperor of Rome during those great battles, he wanted to throw salt on the wound and he wanted people to forget the Jewish people and he wanted to, people to forget the Jewish connection to the land of Israel, to Judea and Samaria, to the coastal plains, to the upper Galilee, the lower Galilee, the Hula Valley, the Golan Heights, the Arava, the Dead Sea. I'm just going over all those different regions and territories that I mentioned in the beginning. And uh, he wanted people to forget it. So not just, not only did he rename the land of Israel, but he gave it the name Palestine, Palestinia, right? Why Palestinia? He named it after our first temple period enemy, right? Our arch nemesis during the first temple period who were the Philistines or in Hebrew, the Plishtim, right? Now, if you don't know who the Philistines are, or you don't recognize or are familiar with that term, so David and Goliath. Everybody knows the story of David and Goliath, the giant that David slew with the slingshots. So Goliath was fighting on behalf of the Plishtim, of the Philistines. Now, who was the first king of Israel? 
A lot of people think it was David, right? David and Melech, but it wasn't David and Melech. David and Melech was the second king of Israel. His father-in-law, right? He married the king's daughter, whose name was Michal. The first king of Israel's father-in-law was Saul or Shaul in Hebrew, Shaul. Saul was the first king of uh, Israel, and he was killed in battle by the Philistines, by the Plishtim. So we can see that the Plishtim, the Philistines, weren't very nice and friendly. There were enemies during the first temple period. And so Hadrian wanted to rename the areas that people would forget about the connection of the Jewish people in the land of Israel. He names it Philistine, Palestine. And why? Be and, and why is it still referred to by many people as Palestine? Well, this land, everything that you saw at the top of the first very beginning, that touch feet, that beautiful overlook that we saw, <clears throat> that entire area, <clears throat> all of Israel, everything you saw all the way from the north, all the way to the south has never been independent during the entire 2000 year exile since the destruction of the second temple and the Romans took over. It hasn't been independent under anyone, whether it was Jews, Christians, Muslims, atheists, Hindus, you name it, never has the land of Israel been independent. It's always been governed and controlled. There's another person running on the path. It's always been governed and controlled by foreign empires and foreign entities. And these foreign empires, these foreign entities could either go back to the original name of Israel or they could keep the name Palestine. And since there was no Philistines, since there was no police team, there would be nobody to rebel for independence. But if they name it Israel, the Jews will get this crazy idea that they have some right to exist and to have independence in their biblical heartland, in their land, every biblical heart, in their land, the land of the Jews, B'nai Yisrael, the land of Israel, the children of Israel, the children of Yaakov. And so the name Palestine just kept for 1,800 years by all of these foreign empires, whether they're ruling from Cairo or Damascus or Istanbul during the Turkish, I mean, even the British ruled here, London ruled here for about 30 years, and they kept the name Palestine as well. It wasn't until 1948, and finally when we declared our independence, now get this, you know, we call ourselves Jews. You know, a Jew, the term Jew, that was a derogatory term that the Romans applied to the people living in Judea, right? Yehuda, this area that we're looking at right now, this is Judea. These are the Judean mountains. Every single hilltop that you see right here 2,000 years ago had a Jewish community that lived here. This is our heartland. You probably had great-great-grandparents that lived just over there. You might have even had great-grandparents who lived right here. Because everywhere you look, you dig down five feet, you're going to find some pottery, you're going to find some ruins, you're going to find something that belonged to a Jewish community, whether it was 2,000 years ago or whether it was earlier than that. Maybe it was only 500 years ago. We don't know when our families left. The fact of the matter is, we don't know when our families left the land of Israel, right? We assume that they left maybe during the Roman period, but they might have left even before that, right? For economic purposes or, you know, because they were being oppressed here. We don't know when they left. But we do know is that our families left at some point. Maybe the Crusader period, maybe it was the Muslim period. We don't, but they left at some point. But at some point, they all lived here somewhere, most likely on these hilltops here in the land of Judea. But we call ourselves Jews. But that was a derogatory term. But we've been called Jews for so long that we just started calling ourselves Jews as well. Well, when we declared independence, 1948, there were three names that we thought about for our new state, this modern state of Israel. Obviously, Israel was one of them. That's the one that was ultimately chosen. The other one was Judea, which was the last name of the kingdom that was here. The land of Israel wasn't known as, as the kingdom of Israel. It was known as the kingdom of Judea. And the third name was actually Palestine. We almost named our new state Palestine because it had been called Palestine for so long that we just also began to call it Palestine because we forgot. But hey, I got out of the car for a reason. And the reason why is I wanted to show you this. And I'm sure you guys saw the little video that I made when I was here kind of hanging out with my son. This is an ancient, like at least a 2000 year old mikvah. And it's not just any old mikvah. In fact, there's another one just over here, but it's not as well preserved or it just hasn't been dug out maybe on the next uh, momentum trip. And if you guys haven't been on a momentum trip, 
you got to come. Please come. I, I, I hope to be on those as well. But maybe we'll come out here, uh, Rabbi Z, and we'll start digging up and seeing what's down here. But you can see here's an opening right here. There's another mikvah right here. So what are these mikvahs doing? And is this a special mikvah? Is it inter what's, what's important about this mikvah is that this is one of the nicest mikvahs that we have unearthed anywhere here in Israel. Now, according to halacha, right? Halacha, a lot of people translate as Jewish law. It's not really Jewish law. It really, um, it is Jewish law, but it really comes from the holach, which means to go. It's the way of the Jew. It's the lens in which we see this world through, in which we determine right from wrong. It's the way of the Jew. Of the Jew. And according to halacha, a mikvah in these ancient times needs to have two entrance ways, right? Or if they didn't have two entrance ways, they needed to have a wall, right? They needed to have a wall, right? So these two entrances of the wall. Here we have two entrances and we have a wall, right? Now, what were these two entrances of the wall purpose for? Is that people went into a mikvah, not to scrub themselves clean, but rather to spiritually purify themselves, to prepare themselves for entering Jerusalem and ultimately going up to the Temple Mount to bring their korban, which is a terrible translation in English as a sacrifice. It's not a sacrifice, it's a korban because the word karo, which means to bring one close. It's not supposed to like, you're not giving up something, you're gaining something, you're building a relationship with the Kaddish Baruch Hu. And that korban, that offering that you were giving, most of it went home with you and you ate it with your family. So it wasn't something that you just, you know, gave to the temple and that was it. There were offerings like that, but most of them were not. And in order to prepare yourself, you need, to you need to spiritually purify yourself before you go up to Jerusalem. Well, in the Gemara, in, our, in the codified oral Torah, in the Gemara, in the Talmud, it says that upon entering Jerusalem, one needs to purify themselves. So the debate and the question was, what does it mean to enter Jerusalem? Does it mean to actually physically be in the parameters, let's say even the old city walls, because it wasn't an old city, that was Jerusalem. Does it mean to be in the walls of Jerusalem or does it just mean to see Jerusalem? And so one opinion was just that you, if you see Jerusalem, you need to purify yourself. The other one is in Jerusalem. So from this point, we said we were just at the top of the hill just a little bit earlier. From this point is the first time that somebody traveling from the south, from Hebron, or even further from Beersheba, from the Negev, from the desert, anybody coming from the south traveling on this path, the path of the patriarchs, the first place they see Jerusalem is from the top of the hill. They can now come down here and they can use this beautiful, gorgeous mikvah that doesn't just have two openings, it has two openings and a wall on it to divide the people who are coming down the right-hand side who are impure to be able to enter inside the mikvah. And I'm going to flip my camera around. I'm not going to enter because I'm afraid I might lose the internet. But if I do, I'll just jump right back on like I did last time. So you can see they would enter impure. And you can see there's still water from the rainy season. They would enter impure from this side, go around and exit the mikvah in a purified state. And the wall having two entrances would make sure and ensure that you wouldn't actually come in contact with somebody who might have some type of spiritual impurity upon them, which then would, would come onto you. And you'd have to repeat the process. And nobody wants to repeat the process. I have to imagine that there was probably some type of fee to use the mikvah. And never mind that, but there's also time involved in it. And you know what? When you got on the Shlosh Raglim, which is the three major holidays, and what are the three major holidays in Judaism where we're commanded, if possible, to go to Harabai, to go to Jerusalem, these three major holidays, well, the first one is coming up in just a couple of weeks' time, and that is Passover, Pesach. And then 50 days after that, you have the holiday of Shavuot, where we celebrate and commemorate the receiving of the Torah on Mount Sinai. And then the third one, the, my favorite holiday, and you have to come to Israel at least once in your life for this holiday. Don't come for touring. It's not a good time to come touring because the place is crazy, but it's a great time to celebrate the holiday of Sukkot. So Passover, Shavuot, Sukkot, all these Jews are coming down this path coming from the south they're going into the mikvah how many people you don't want to go into that more water any more than you need to so nobody wanted to bump into something that was impure or somebody who was impure and so they kept it two entrances and a wall very very important check this out 
This right here is a small wine press. Okay, so here in Judea, we have wonderful, excellent wines, and we're going to see a winery a little bit later. But here, somebody would put their grapes, and you can see the little channel right here. And they would literally, you know, step on their grapes, crush their grapes, right? Squeeze out all of the juice. And apparently, there's some type of bacteria yeast on feet that help the fermentation process. So that's why they would stomp on it with their feet. And the all the juice would flow out into the vat down below and you can bottle that and you can have some wine. Now this wine, this is a nice small one. This was probably a shopkeeper who wanted to sell people, sure, wine to celebrate with, wine to be able to go into Jerusalem with some wine, but also as a souvenir, something to take home with you. My wine that I got on the way to Jerusalem, the first place that I could see where I went to the mid with this special wine, I'm going to bring it home and I'm going to have it for Shabbat with my family, invite some guests and some friends and you know, the community at large, that we can all partake in that because not everybody could afford to go to Jerusalem. If you couldn't afford to go to Jerusalem, you weren't obligated to go to Jerusalem. These were people who had the capability and the ability, people who could also walk. What happens if you can't walk? Do you need to go to Jerusalem? No. So people are buying something here and being able to bring that experience home to their neighbors and to their friends. So just absolutely amazing that we have this incredible archaeology here in the path of the patriarchs. So we're going to take a little short ride to our next stop. And along the way, Rabbi Z, I don't know if anybody has any questions, but I'd be happy to field any questions. Otherwise, I'll keep rambling on. Yes, if somebody wants to ask any questions, they can uh, send me a, a message in the chat and I will uh, ask David. Fantastic. David, Fantastic. Uh, and the, yeah. No, you're good. I'm just I'm supposed okay, to. Okay, great. So I am going to flip my camera around. If something comes in, you let me know. So I see we're approaching 11 o'clock, but um, please stick around. If you can't stick around, you can't stick around. What can you do? But uh, we're going to stop just a little bit up ahead. We're going to talk a little bit about the story of Hanukkah and a little bit of biblical uh, agriculture. And then I'm going to end the tour soon by the path of the patriarchs. And as we're going down here, they just actually did some, some, oops, I didn't put my seatbelt on. Uh, they just did some uh, repair work here. Oops. They did some repair work on the road. I'm going to let this guy pass me. David, I have a, I have a question. Whenever you're ready to field the question. Sure, I'm ready. So Rabbi Josh Golding is asking, and if uh, in the future somebody wants to be anonymous, you can let me know. Sorry, Rabbi Josh. But the name of the Path of the Patriarchs, who came up with that name? Why exactly? And when did that name come into being? Awesome. Great question. I just want to stop here. This is mile marker number 12. We're heading south. The other mile marker you saw was mile marker number 11. All right, so we're heading south. So we just traveled one Roman mile, which is a little bit less than an American mile. Um, but we are traveling south. So now we're not, we're 12 miles from Yerushalayim, um, heading south towards Hebron. So to answer the question, when did the name of the Path of Patriarchs come? Who came up with it and why? So I'll start with the simplest answer, which is why. It's called the Path of Patriarchs because this is the ancient road. This road existed before Avraham. So we could call it the road from before the time of the patriarchs. This road existed before them. Avraham didn't make up this road. This was an ancient road. People would travel on the ridge lines here in the mountainous areas and not up and down all those mountains. Uh, for the same reason why today, you know, we blast through mountains and build tunnels or we build bridges so that we don't have to go up and down all of the different um mountains because it takes up too much gas. In ancient times, you have to feed your animals, you have to rest them, you have to give them water. So this was a very sensible place to build this road. Today, just parallel to the ancient path of the patriarchs, you have the modern highway of highway number 60, okay? Another famous highway or famous ancient route through the land of Israel is the Via Maris, the way of the sea, which is where highway six is in Israel. David, if you're still looking at your map, Highway 6 runs along the sea, right? The Via Maris. 
path of the patriarchs. Now, who called it the path of the patriarchs or since when? I really can't answer that. I do not know the answer. Um, it could have been referred to as the path of the patriarchs for a very, very long time, or it could have been a modern name that was given to the path, you know, once we return to this area after 67, you know, in order to promote it, you know, that people know where they are and what they're doing, what's going on. Um, so, yeah, so I hope that answers your question. At least that's the best of my ability uh, that I can answer it. But I am going to jump out right now. And uh, you can see right over here, there's actually a, uh, an Arab farm. There's an Arab home over here, just along the path of the patriarchs. You can see they've got some clothes that's hanging out. Uh, letting it dry. And this is uh, one of their fields right here. You can see it looks like uh, maybe pomegranate trees. Oh, no, these are vineyards. These are also, these are vineyards down there. Those will become grapes in a little while. And I stopped here in order to show you this agriculture because this agriculture is still grown in the same way as it was grown uh, 3,000 years ago, 2,000 years ago, during the days of the Bible, during the days of the temple. And Gush Etzion, where we are right now, was a, look at these beautiful wild flowers down here, the beautiful yellow flowers. Uh, this is already the middle of spring, if not towards the end of spring already, if you can imagine that here in Israel. But Gush Etzion has an abundant amount of water, living water, springs. There are literally over a dozen springs just in this area around these hills, uh, many of which I actually go to. We have like, you know, we go to to uh, refresh ourselves and to clean ourselves both, not both, but just really spiritually. Um, and it's amazing. And these springs, they would divert the water through channels in order to irrigate these fields. Now, these fields, it's easy to grow these fields, not today and not back then. Now, what do I mean by that? Hold on, I'm just flipping the camera around. What do I mean by that is that... Um, the slopes here in Gush Etzion and the Judea Mountains are very steep, which means that most of the soil erodes down to the bottom of the valley. So the valley is very rich and has a nice soil. That is where the Philistines or the, or the Canaanites, right? The, the Canaan, the uh, African tribes that came up north and settled a little bit in this area. Uh, they would, they were, farming in the valleys. Now, when Joshua led the Israelites over the Jordan River and the conquest of, of Canaan took place, the tribes of Israel went to Yeshua, to Joshua, right? The book of Joshua. And they complained in the city of Shiloh, right? Just a little north of here, also on that spine, on, that, on the, the biblical heartland of Israel, the backbone of uh, Israel. Shiloh, where the Mishkan, which was, the Mishkan was like the portable tabernacle uh, that traveled with the Jewish people throughout the 40 years of the Exodus in the Sinai Desert, but also traveled with the Jewish people until we finally built a permanent Mishkan, which would become known as the Temple in Jerusalem. The Mishkan, uh, what was it? Oh, was in Shiloh, and the people came to Joshua, and they complained. They said the Philistines and the Canaanites are in the valley, and there's no place for us to grow any fruit trees. And what are we going to do? And Yeshua said, "Are you kidding me? Use that Yiddish kov, use that Jewish mind. Uh, God blessed us with these incredible brains. Use it. Be innovative. Be innovative. The startup nation didn't start, you know, with the dot com era. Startup startup nation already started when we came into the land of Israel. He says, be innovative." Go up to the hilltops, build terraces, right? Terraces to stop the erosion, these walls that you can see along the hills over here. Build terraces to stop the erosion and dig out cisterns to trap the rainwater and aqueducts to divert the springs to irrigate your fields. And that is what we have here. We have the irrigation of the fields taking place from spring water and from cisterns. And archaeologically speaking, this is the first time that we see cisterns being dug out in mass here in the land of Israel is when the Jews enter the land of Israel 
um, during the days of Joshua, who was the successor who came after Moshe Rabbeinu. Moshe Rabbeinu never entered the land of Israel. We're not going to go into the reasons why, but he never entered into the land of Israel. His number one disciple, Yeshua, he would lead the Jewish people across the Jordan River after a year of mourning. <clears throat> and the first day they would go to Shechem, which the Romans called Neopolis, the Arabs now call Nablus because there's no put in the sound. They, um, this, is, this is the first place that we can see that cisterns are being built during the days of Joshua. Now, you can't see it, it's getting dark and, and I need to change my glasses. These are prescription glasses. So it's a little funny me wearing sunglasses. I'm going to change them in the car. But just over there, there's an Arab community, a small little shanty Arab community. And they call their community Hermot uh, Zacharia, the ruins of Zacharia. Now, we know the name Zacharia, right? Our rabbi, right? Rabbi, Rabbi Zach, Rabbi Z, his now, name Zacharia. Not my Hebrew name, but that's besides the point. Not your Hebrew name. Okay, long long story for a different time. Oh, I'm looking forward to it when you get back here to Eretz Yisrael. So who's Zechariah? Zechariah, we know, is, was, was a big prophet. We have the book of Zechariah in the Tanakh. But this isn't after uh, Zechariah from the prophet. It was probably somebody who lived there, who started the town, whose name was Zechariah. But why is it called Chirbat Zechariah? Because it was destroyed. It was ruined um, during the Roman period. Again, when Hadrian destroyed Betar, he destroyed Zechariah as well. and the Arabs who moved in there called it the ruins, the Romans first, and then the, the, the Arabs there, they called it the ruins of Zachariah. There was a place there called Zachariah, the ruins of Zachariah. And to this very day, the Arabs who lived there, they still called it Herbat Zachariah. But a famous battle took place right here. And this is the story of Hanukkah, when the Greeks were coming in, and the Greeks had a mighty, mighty, crazy big army, and they're marching in with like 30,000 soldiers and you can read about this in the book of maccabees now the book of maccabees was not included in the tanakh in the bible and therefore a lot of jews really don't know about the book of maccabees it was oops hold on one second it was um really preserved by the church believe it or not who um who some sects actually did codify it and it's in the christian bible but they do often read from it and Speaking of Christians and the story of Hanukkah, I feel like even Christians really should celebrate the story of Hanukkah because Christians obviously believe in Jesus. But guess what? Without the story of Hanukkah and the redemption of the Jewish people and the land of Israel, there is no second continuation of the second temple period. There would be no Jesus. So they should really be celebrating Hanukkah as well. I'm going to stick the phone out of the car again so you guys can see this as i continue driving down the path of the patriarchs we got one last stop so please do bear with me um i know it's 11 o'clock already but it'd be very very quick um hopefully we'll be able to see something but it's a nice little story to end the tour with but continue with the story that we're talking about in the book of maccabees it talks about the 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 um the greeks coming in thirty thousand soldiers a hundred tanks and I know you guys are thinking to yourself, tanks, what is this guy talking about? So it wasn't tanks like we have today. Ancient tanks were war elephants. And they came in with these elephants <clears throat> and, and uh, they're heading towards Jerusalem and Yehuda HaMaccabee, right? Yehuda, Judah, Judah the Maccabee and, and his, his brother, Elazar, they hear about this. And Elazar says, that's it. I'm going out there. I'm going to take them on. And he comes running out here. And with his sword, he starts, you know, slashing and slicing and dicing and, you know, slaughtering all of these Greek soldiers. And he's running through the lines and he sees like off in the distance, this beautiful war elephant, this tank that is shimmering because it's plated in gold. And he says, that guy is the head. He's the chief. He's the commander. You, you know, when you want to kill the snake, you got to cut the head off. And he goes there and uh, he kills the elephant and kills the commander of the uh, Greek troops who are here. And he, um, oh, people are turning in here and I'm crossing the street. And I'm going to drive down this little side road, continuing really on the path of the patriarchs, but I'm going to some vineyards I want to show you. And he, and he kills the commander of the uh, Greek troops who are on their way to Jerusalem and is a major blow and a major defeat to the Greeks. 
And that is taking place right here on the path of the patriarchs. So really already in this tour, we have spanned, you know, the, the, almost the entire length of Jewish history here in Israel from the days of Abraham and the first temple period, and the second temple period, and the ancient mikvah, and we touched upon the diaspora, and Hanukkah during the second temple period, and the diaspora, and the Roman pillars, and of course, 1967, and the return to this area, and the construction, and the rebuilding of, uh, oops, I think I went too far, and the rebuilding of, uh, of this area, hold on one second, I, did I pass it? No, it's still further up, I hope. Um, and the rebuilding of, um, of the land of Israel. And we're going to end our tour. And I do realize that it's dark, but we're going somewhere. Where we're going to be close to something. Oh, my gosh. Look at this. You can see the beautiful lights. You can see the beautiful lights here. Give me one second here to jump out of the car, put the emergency brake on. I, mean, I haven't really been out here in a little while, and I should have realized that these beautiful vineyards that are usually here would not be so beautiful during this time of the year. But what you're looking at right here are some vineyards that will be in full bloom. Barbar right now, but will be in full bloom, you know, come the summertime. And this is from the Gush Etzion Winery. And I just wanted to say very, very quickly, as uh, it's dark already here, that wine is a significant part of Judaism, that uh, we say many, many blessings on wine. We do Kiddush and Havdalah and Passover. We come, it's coming up. We do four cups of wine. And when they wanted to grow these vineyards here in the Judean mountains, the experts said, you're crazy. They're not going to grow here. The ground isn't fit for it. And the Jews who are very Zionistic and very devout and religious said, you know what? In our books, it says our ancestors grew grapes here. And it says during the redemption of Israel, grapes will grow here again. And we believe, and I believe personally, that this is the beginning of the Geula, that we're in it right now. And that Proof of it is that these wines aren't just grown, but they're growing some of the best wines anywhere in the world. We're winning awards around the world. So I hope you guys all are able to find some kosher wine out there in Louisville. I have no doubt that Rabbi Z has a good connection. Go ahead, buy yourselves a nice bottle of wine this week. And on Shabbat, on Friday night, have some friends over celebrate. Rabbi Z, maybe you guys can do a nice little Shabbaton and have some of those beautiful wines from Israel, from the Judean mountains, reminisce about this tour a little bit, connect to it at even a deeper level, and, uh, and to the stories that we're reading right now in the Tanakh, which is the story of the Exodus, right? The traveling through the desert here to the land of Israel. And uh, hopefully in that merit, you guys should all be able to at least visit here very, very soon. We hope to see you here this summer on a momentum trip, on a family trip, but somehow, some way to be able to celebrate here with me. And you're all invited to my home right here at Gush Etzion um, for a Shabbat dinner or for a barbecue or for whatever you would like. And I'll make myself available right now for anyone who has any questions or wants to ask anything. Just before that, just a big thank you to David Sussman for... Uh for having this, for doing this. I'm, it's been a, probably a wild year for him and uh, yeah. all the uh, tourism ending in uh, Israel very uh, abruptly and amazing kudos to you for really reinventing, you know, Israel and allowing us to experience Israel like this. It's, it's pretty awesome. And uh, I, I can't thank you enough for doing this and for allowing, you know, us here in America and the Chutzla Aretz to really stay connected and uh, this was certainly an amazing experience, something that I have never experienced a live stream tour like this. And so maybe continue with uh, another one sometime in the future. Yeah, please, God, I would love it. I really appreciate the opportunity. And, and I will stress that as well. Like it has been a crazy year. And uh, to have this opportunity to be able to do what I love and to be passionate about it, and to be able to share the land with you and your community, is, is, uh, it makes me feel great so thank you
awesome. Thank you very much. Thanks, David. We really enjoyed you guys it. got it. Awesome. Wonderful. Yeah.